Okay, William Quinn. I guess the first thing I wanted to do was kind of establish your Cape Cotter, right? Born in Orleans. Uh, you want my family tree? Oh, just a little brief rundown. Okay, Richard Higgins settled in East Ham in 1644. He had two sons, uh, Jonathan and Benjamin. Jonathan married uh, Elizabeth Rogers, whose father came over on the Mayflower. Uh, my mother's mother was descended from Jonathan. My father's mother was descended from Benjamin. So uh, my, f my grandfather, where the name came from, came from uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. He was on a lumber schooner that ran aground in East Dam in 1887. And uh, they sent him ashore to get help. And uh, discretion being the better part of valor, he figured he had all the sea time he wanted and he stayed on Cape Cod. And he settled and married uh, my grandmother, Lizzie Deborah Higgins. And uh, they had uh, five children. And uh, my mother's father was uh, George Ellis, who was descended from Lieutenant John Ellis, who settled in Sandwich in 1639. So we go way back. When did the Irishman Quinn come along? Well, that was my grandfather. Okay. And uh, he jumped ship and uh, decided to stay on Cape Cod, and he went to work here on, and became a fisherman. Well, I mean, shell fisherman. Yeah. He didn't want to go back to sea. And you can't blame him, because yeah. uh, uh, on the life aboard a fishing vessel or any kind of vessel, coastal schooner or anything, in the late 1800s was no picnic, believe me. I mean, you, uh, it's, and on my latest book, I write that uh, in those days, uh, the timid man stayed ashore and the more stout-hearted man went to sea. I'm a Navy man, too. Uh, when uh, the war came along. Uh, I got out of high school. Uh, I was only 17 years old and only in the 10th grade and uh, I had stayed back a year and uh, you know screwing off and raising hell and like 16, 17 year old kids do. So I said to hell with school. I knew, I knew all I wanted to know so I went in the Navy and uh, I spent four years in the Navy. And I can tell you about, uh, you talk about weather East of, east of Nantucket, boy. We rode out 50-foot uh, waves and everything else aboard that ship. It was a big ship, but uh, I, I know what I know what the ocean can do. Yeah. I have a, nothing but the highest respect for the ocean. It's true. And, uh, I can understand why my grandfather said, "The hell with it. I'm going to stay on the land." You know. And, uh, you have uh, are there three Quinn boys? Is that five? Uh, there's five. Okay. Yeah. I know Ellis, and of course you and. Howard just passed away last year. Okay, Howard. He's the oldest. Right. And my, my brother Warren lives down here. He's the bulldozer operator. And my youngest brother, Leslie, he, uh, a few years back, he gra he retired from the Air Force. He was, he, he was around here most of his young life up until the time he was 20. And uh, he worked at the Chatham Airport. He worked in, all over the place. And then he went into the Air Force and spent his 20-year uh, career in the Air Force. And he ended up as a lieutenant colonel and retired from SAC. He used to fly the B-52s. I used to and see Warren at the airport a lot. Yeah. Yeah, both Warren and Ellis and Leslie, all three of them fly. Uh -huh. I fly as a passenger. I shoot the pictures. I never bothered to get a license because uh, I figured better that I concentrate on what I'm doing and let somebody else concentrate yeah. on the flying. It's a good system. Yeah. Safer. You So you grew up here in Orleans and uh, yeah. uh, went to school locally? Born and raised and uh, grew up in the 30s. I can remember as a boy, uh, a real young boy, my mother uh, and father went down to the beach a little bit south of the present parking lot, pitched a tent and we had we slept on cots, uh, all five of us boys, and spent the whole summer. Well, it was only three of us then, but uh, actually four of us because Warren was a baby. But uh, we spent the summer on the beach, and uh, of course there was no law against it. I mean, nobody else cared anything about it, and uh, there were only maybe two or three beach buggies that went down to the beach all the time. We're, Model A's usually, right? Model A's, and there was uh, a fancy truck with big tires that belonged to the Coast Guard. And the, that's when the Coast Guard station was at, on Pochett Island there. And, uh, but uh, 
you know, this this was uh, this was another time, another another era. Yeah. And as a boy, I can remember standing on the beach and watching a four-masted schooner go by. I can remember it vividly in my mind. Now this was in the early 30s, and you know, shortly after that, they they all went to pot, most of them, and there were very few schooners, but. In the early 30s, it was still running, and I can remember as a small boy, I must have been, I must have been only six or seven years old, but I can remember seeing a four-masted schooner go by. Wow. And, uh, so you would have gone to um, the elementary school where the town hall is now? Yes, that was the, we had Miss, uh, Miss Arnold, and Bertha Keefe was my second grade teacher, and uh, who else? Uh, Miss Worth, uh, she used to live right around the corner over here, and uh, I can remember her as an elderly, elderly lady. But uh, yeah, the old school, two school teachers. That was, uh, and then of course, uh, when we were, how old were we? Uh, next to the, what is now the town hall, used to, they used to have the field house, which was a huge uh, sports area where they had uh, basketball. And, uh, where would that have been located, Bill? Right Not where the, the Little League Field. Yeah, side. right where the Little League Field is now. Oh. Yeah. I never realized there was a facility there. Great there. big, huge building there, and it burned down. In oh. fact, I can remember the day it burned down. We were sitting at home uh, playing Monopoly or something, the, the, and uh, there was no school. I think it was either during the summer or, or during a vacation or something. And uh, uh, I think I looked out the window and saw the smoke and I hollered at my mother and and she came in and looked and then she called the fire department. And uh, I can remember Henry Perry, he always used to blame everything on us boys. And he came down and the first thing he did was come in and see us and my mother said, Henry, you get the hell out of here. My boys were all here and I was with them when that thing took off. <laughs> and they found out later that it was a bad oil burner or something. But. Uh, Leave it to Henry Perry. He was always blaming us for everything. Who I can that? remember one time that the that the uh, the chapel that now is part of the historical society. They had the Heard Chapel, and it was on top of the hill in the cemetery. In the cemetery, right. and uh, we had we had a BB gun. We went up and we shot some windows up. <laughs> well, you know, Henry Perry came around, and we swore up and down to our mother that we didn't shoot those windows out. And he and she swore up and down to Henry that she'd haul him into court and get a liar and everything while well, the whole thing died. But anyway, we actually did it. Years later, we told her, and she said, I could have killed you kids. You know? <laughs> it was funny. Who were some of the characters that you went to school with then that, oh, that stand I, out most in your mind? I really can't remember because uh, uh, most of the people that I went to school with are now gone or they're uh, moved away and, and a lot of people have left. Mm. And, uh, if somebody could remind me, and like Mariel Higgins, she was in my class, and uh, gee, I can't remember too many of the others. Now, was the high school across the street? Yes, it was up on top of the hill where the Legion building is now, mm -hmm. and uh, you've got pictures of that, some of HK's yeah. pictures. Yeah. And uh, the uh, I went to high school up there for oh only about one year while they were building the new high school. That's when uh, Leonardi took over as principal. Uh, I was, I, I think I was under Pop Stewart for one year. And uh, then Leonardi took over. Well, I, that was seventh and eighth grade stuff. And uh, then they built the field house and the seventh and eighth grades were down in there. But uh, it wasn't long after that, the field house burned down and they built a new school, the new high school up here. What they've. That's uh, now the middle school. Which is now uh, the local pizza parlor. I mean, that's what it looks like. It's, uh, I don't know who in their right mind would ever create such a god awful looking thing, but uh, boy, talk about visual pollution. I know. And, uh, when, uh, so did you go away to uh, school or, or? No, when I was, uh, when I was 17, as I say, I was just fooling around. And so I went in the Navy and spent four years in the Navy. When I, when I got out, I was 21 and I realized 
how dumb I was. So I went to Boston and went to school. I went to, I finished up my high school in Newman Prep in Boston and then uh, went to Tufts College after that. Hmm. So that's about all there is to me. And I worked... Uh, well, there's a lot more to you, Bill, than... Left. Well, I worked, <laughs> what I did, I, I worked in Boston and uh, then I started in photography and uh, got interested in photography and worked heavily at photography. I was a metalsmith in the Navy, so. Uh, Were you in the Seabees? No, I was on I was on a repair ship in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. and I learned, you know, how to work with sheet metal and everything, stainless steel, the whole bit. So that that come in handy when I was working with. Uh, uh, when I first started in photography, I needed some stainless steel tanks, and and you know they had prices of a hundred, two hundred dollars, and things like that, and I couldn't afford them. But uh, who was it? Louis Eldridge was working at uh, Smith Brothers, and uh, he had, uh, I think it was, eighteen gauge stainless steel down there that they worked with. So I went down, bought some eighteen gauge stainless steel, built my own tanks, and soldered them, and and. Uh, if I made a mistake, why Louis was there to straighten me out, and and uh, I got stainless steel tanks for about five percent of what I would pay for them ordinarily, and so that's where my knowledge, prior knowledge, come in handy. But I worked in photography for a number of years. Uh, I was shooting real estate pictures and kidnapping and all the rest of that jazz for four or five years, and got sick and tired of it. And uh, so I got, I remember uh, Brooks Thayer's father, C.J. Thayer, he ran- He established uh, the camp in South Orleans? Yeah, a camp at Namacourt. And he told me, he said, uh, I need some 16 millimeter motion pictures of my boys in camp. Could you do the job for me? He said, sure. And I had experimented a lot with eight millimeters, so I had had a lot of experience with shooting motion pictures. So I went out and I bought a 16 millimeter camera. It was a uh, I can't even remember the name, but now I still got it too. But uh, I shot oh I think four or five hundred feet of film for him one summer of all his activities, and he was quite pleased with it. And then uh, one day. And it was around Labor Day. They had the beach buggy parade down here. Remember the beach buggy, Masters of Beach Buggy Association? So I shot a piece of black and white film and sent it into Channel 4 in Boston. And the next day they ran it on the news as a feature story. So right after that, the boss up there, Denny Whitmarsh, called me and he said, um, you want to represent me on Cape Cod? Fine. So I started shooting films for, uh, for Channel 4 News. And then... Uh, it was in the, that de December of that year. That was when they were building the Texas Towers offshore. And uh, they had an article in the paper. I used to watch the paper, see what was going to happen. So they had an article paper that they were going to send the first helicopter to the Texas Tower. And it was going to fly from North Truro. So I got bundled myself down in North Truro. I figured I'd get a picture of the helicopter landing and, and them loading the Christmas tree and the mail and stuff like that and taken off and go into the Texas Tower. Well, come to find out <coughs> that the nation's press, AP, UPI, NBC, CBS, everybody, they were all going to be aboard this helicopter as a news team going, making the first trip to the Texas Tower. Well, uh, the trip was scheduled for Monday and it got weathered out Monday and got fogged out Tuesday and weathered out Wednesday. Well, and uh, the wind was blowing, and you know, it got till Sunday before it went. And <laughs> these guys don't work on Sunday. <laughs> so I'm at the Truro Air Force Base, and I said to the colonel there, and I said, uh, uh, I represent, uh, I had my Roly with me, and uh, I was shooting pictures for Associated Press, Sills, as well as the, as the motion pictures. So I said, well, why don't I go out with those guys and, and uh, get some good uh, film for television. He said, good idea. He said, sign this paper. So he signed a paper absolving the Air Force of any responsibility should I be killed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so make a long story short. I flew out there and I got some fabulous footage. 
and uh, flew back and uh, landed in, back in Arturo and I got you know a nice roll of film uh, so I, I mean in those days uh, you drive to Hyannis Yarmouth actually you check with the conductor and you get your film in a bag uh, marked where it's supposed to go the film for the television he was to give it to a yellow cab and the film for the Associated Press he was to give uh, oh, that somebody would usually pick it up so then I went and I called Boston and told them the film was coming I called AP and told them the film was coming well my f my pictures on the AP were on the pages uh, in the newspapers the next day and it hit all the newspapers picture was a picture of the helicopter parked on the Texas Tower I had backed off as far as I could get to get a picture of the helicopter with the with the with the tower and uh, and I had called the television uh, channel 4 at uh, it was four o'clock in the afternoon and I called them and said uh, I just been on the helicopter to the Texas Tower and the editor said sure you were and uh, he said do you realize all the news services from all over were going to go out to that and and because it was Sunday they didn't go I said no I didn't know that he says I said well it's on the train you'll get it okay the envelope came in the newsroom that night Sunday night and uh, it laid on the desk and they didn't use it Sunday night well the boss called me the next morning and uh, he asked me what happened he said why didn't you call I said I did call I said I called it so and so such and such a time I talked to so and so and told him the film was there and he said okay so at noontime they put the film on and they had a, had a key underneath it exclusive film you know and, uh, which it was naturally. <laughs> How long ago was this uh, built? This was 1955. And where are those Texas Towers located? Oh, uh, they were well. The Texas Tower, uh, the number number one was never built. That was supposed to have been up off Maine. The number two was exactly 100 miles due east of Chatham, out on George's Bank. The number three, of course, was the uh, uh, one off Nantucket, and the number four was Old Shaky off uh, New Jersey, where they lost so many men mm -hmm. when it went down. But anyway, uh, come to find out that the news editor who let the stuff sit on the desk got fired <laughs> because there was an exclusive news story. Sure. And uh, the, the towers had been in the news and, and everything, you know. It was, uh, it was quite, a, quite a coup, you know. I'm familiar with your shipwrecks book that you published. Um, I know you're working on one now on Saltworks that I want to talk about in a minute. And there's others, too. Right there. Uh, well, we did a book on, I did the, the first book is on the uh, shipwrecks around Cape Cod, second book was shipwrecks around New England, and the third book was shipwrecks around Maine, and the fourth book was shipwrecks along the Atlantic coast, and Paul Morris and I did uh, shipwrecks in New York waters. We, we pooled our collections, and uh, I did the little small booklet on the Eldia when she came ashore. And I did a small book on the 36500, and uh, I have just finished, uh, well, I haven't quite finished with the Saltworks book. I did a, uh, a small paste-up of copy and Xeroxes of pictures, and uh, Ben Muse is looking at it now. He wants to publish it, and uh, I've got to do some, uh, some polishing, that's all, and f to finish that up. And then uh, I'm starting to work on uh, shipwrecks around Boston Harbor. I've been working on that for about a year now. And uh, I've got my mind in for a couple more Cape Cod books. And uh, I'm looking, just scratching the surface of research material available. Because uh, I like to illustrate my books with pictures. And, and uh, uh, I find that you can see so much in a photograph that you can't write about. Mm -hmm. And the Saltworks book, I'm uh, really looking forward to it, and I've heard of other people who are anxiously awaiting its arrival. A lot of people are going to be surprised. I mean, if you can look at, uh, I've got a picture in there of a map of the Saltworks around Rock Harbor in the 1850s, and I mean, it's just acres and acres and acres of these salt vats that where they uh, evaporated the seawater and uh, well it was a uh, uh, 
what do they call it? Uh, the lazy man's uh, gold mine. Because uh, environmentally it was correct. We used the wind to pump water. We had the small little salt mills that would pump water into the top vat. And uh, you, pro you could program your, your, uh, your vats and, and so that you didn't have to work too hard. And uh, about once every three weeks you had a lot of hard work to do, but the rest of the time it was pretty laid out laziness. And uh, so the top vat was filled with regular salt water right from the ocean. And this contained animals and vegetation which was precipitated out after about four or five days. And then you just turn the valve and it went down into the next vat. And uh, lime and things like that were precipitated out in the second vat. And then after another week or so, you'd turn the valve and put it all down into the third vat. And it was pretty briny right there. And uh, you leave it in the third vat for about a week and a half. And then you just take a shovel and go in there and shovel out your salt. Wow. And it was, as I said, it was a lazy man's gold mine. Where, where did um, the, uh, the citizens of Orleans, where would they have gotten their salt prior to these? Well, everything was imported. Prior to the Revolutionary War, uh, all of the salt came from Turks Island, uh, for, from the Mediterranean. And, uh, you mean Turks and Caicos when you say Turks Island? Down in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they had big salt works. Uh, same, only they, they were a little bit, they didn't have the salt vats. Salt vats were invented on Cape Cod. Uh, these are wooden vats made out of um, two-inch boards, soft pine from Maine, uh, which would, at the time was cheap. And uh, I can remember reading in the research about uh, one farmer who want, told his sons he wanted to go con cracking. And he'd load his schooner up with corn and head down to Boston and then down east. And he'd come back with a load of lumber and they'd build salt works. And, uh, and the vats were about uh, uh, anywhere from 12 to 16 feet square and 12 inches deep. And uh, they'd fill it nine inches of water, salt water, weighed about two tons. So they had to have plenty of support underneath the vats. That's where the uh, cedar posts came in to being. They had a lot of cedar posts because of course the cedar wouldn't, uh, wouldn't rot. And uh, in fact, right now, they're in dredging in Rock Harbor. You can go down there and you can see they've brought up a lot of wood and it's cedar. And they apparently, when they got through with the salt works, uh, they took all the lumber to build houses and barns with and they threw the cedar logs into, the, into, the, into Rock Harbor. And now uh, they're dredging a little bit deeper than anybody else has and they're bringing up a lot of that cedar. So they hit a cedar uh post or a cedar yeah. uh, and, and broke down some of the equipment. I was yeah. talking to Truman Henson down there yeah. the other day. It's, uh, it's amazing and that stuff all, that's back from the early 1800s. And so, but they had salt works, in fact, right next door here, uh, in the lot next door here, you go down a little bit and toward the cove and there was a huge salt works there. I have a picture of it taken from across the cove. And uh, <clears throat> there was another, uh, they were actually around the Orleans Town Cove, there was a half a dozen salt works. And then down in East Dam, uh, all the way down to the Salt Pond, there were salt works. And on the Bay Shore, there was uh, a huge salt works at Rock Harbor, and a lot more off Bolt Meadow Creek, and then uh, a lot more down. Uh, Pamet River was loaded with salt works. So Provincetown, from the Churro Line all the way across the back of Provincetown, which is now Bradford Street, was all salt works. Everything was just salt works. A lot of those houses in Provincetown on Bradford Street were all built from the salt works boards. You go down there, you go up in the attics of some of those houses and look at the boards, they'd be all white. Salt works was a huge business. Uh, probably around, I'd say, two hundred and fifty dollars to $300,000 a year was made just making salt down here. Wow. You cannot get the, an exact figure, mainly because a lot of these fishermen own salt works. And you know where the salt from their salt work went. It was when they needed the salt to salt their fish. Because yeah. they didn't have refrigeration or ice in those days. And uh, ice was a delicacy. If they, if they brought ice from the ponds and put it in the ice houses, they'd never waste ice on fish. 
They'd use ice for their uh, cocktails and things like that in the summertime. So what does salt exactly do to fish? It cures it, and how does it preserve it? Preserves how does it, it act as a preservative? Well, the, the uh, fish doesn't, uh, they use salt for fish, they use it for meat. I mean, down south, they, they salted pork all the time. You've heard of salt pork. Uh, everything must stop was salted. the decaying process, it must kill the, the bacteria. Yeah, it, it, you see, they packed it in salt, rock salt. And uh, they, they'd go fishing and uh, uh, fillet the fish right on board the ship, come back to uh, Provincetown and uh, put it out on the flakes to dry. And then resalt it and head for the Caribbean with a for the full cargo of salt fish in the Caribbean this is in the early 1800s now they had slaves to work the sugar plantations and slave to do, to do you know lumbering and all that kind of stuff and they'd go down there with a cargo of salt fish which would feed the slaves and they'd come back with a cargo of uh, mahogany uh, different types of lumber with sugar and molasses and rum by god boy they used to get bring back Huge bats, bats of rum, which of course was New England staple. Uh, I mean, when back in the old days, why well, everything had a, had a touch of rum in it. Mm -hmm. To uh, well, you had to flavor it with something. You know? <laughs> I mean, that was, <laughs> in those days, that was it was great. Well, what um, was it? Salt mining that that put an end to the salt industry. Uh, actually, the Erie Canal. You see, they found the the big, huge salt deposits up near Onondaga, in New York. And uh, this, the, these were found, oh, in the late 1700s. But there was no way to get the, the salt down to New York to spread it to the markets. And uh, so they dug the Erie Canal, and uh, that's one of the things, that's just one thing that they uh, did was to start bringing salt down from Onondaga mm -hmm. using the Erie Canal. And then that opened up the market and uh, dropped the price to, uh, you know, 50 cents a bushel. But these guys continued into the 1880s making salt. In Orleans? In, no, in, in, no, in, in, in uh, Yarmouth. <coughs> they had, uh, they had a, uh, a magnesia plant in Yarmouth, and they had uh, the, a lot of fishermen would come up from New York, uh, fishing vessels with a crew of three, and they'd bring the rest of the crew, uh, enlist the rest of the crew in Yarmouth. They'd come right up Bass River and load with salt. So I should say salts, plural. Cape Cod salts and and sodium chloride. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd, they'd hire on a crew of 12 or 15 men from Cape Cod to go out on the banks fishing with them, and they'd load with Cape Cod salt at the same time, and uh, mainly because of, uh, of trade and everything. And of course, um, they had the huge salt works there on Bass River. I mean, what's now all summer houses used to be all salt works. Mm -hmm. When did uh, the um, salt works begin to disappear in Orleans? What period? Of time? Uh, right after 1850, they start, uh, because the market went way down, and uh, as I say, it was a lazy man's gold mine, and so they found another way to make money. Uh, they started growing cranberries, and uh, then they started building tourist hotels. In the 1860s, or was it the 70s? I've got some. Uh, uh, I, I did a lot of digging into the uh, uh, Bastable Patriot, and the Patriot has a lot of articles about uh, tourists and uh, young ladies. Uh, uh, I could read you some fabulous articles out of the Patriot about tourism in the summer, and it started in the, well, it was late 1850s when it started. They'd come down here on the train? No, they would come down here uh, on the packet vessels. The train didn't come down here until, uh, well, it didn't. It came to Yarmouth in uh, to Sandwich in 1849, and didn't come to Yarmouth until mm, probably the 1850s, mid 50s, mm -hmm. and then it finally got here in Orleans in the 1860s. But the uh, uh, the newspaper articles always referred to the people riding the packet vessels, those are the sailing vessels from Boston to Cape Cod. And every town had their packet vessel. Some had two or three. There were three here in Orleans. Where would they arrive? Rock Harbor. They had a lot more harbor then. I got a picture of one of them uh, at low tide. She's just sitting right on the sand. Huh. It's 
small two-masted vessels. So that was the forerunner of passengers arriving here by train. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And in the 1860s, the train took over. And <coughs> And, but people still rode the stagecoach because the train only went so far and the rest of the trip was by stagecoach. You know. Uh, I know that when the pilgrims arrived, uh, there was huge hardwood forests all over Cape Cod. And these were uh, all cut down. And they first started clearing land for farms. And then they started cutting trees to build ships with. Uh, I know it's difficult for you to believe, but they built ships here in Orleans, quite a few of them. In fact, all over Cape Cod. Uh, my 1859 sh register, I have uh, the front page of the Yarmouth register carries uh, the listing of every ship registered on Cape Cod for each town. And there was 600 and some odd vessels, 55,000 tons of shipping from Cape Cod. And now this was all the way Falmouth, uh, all the way to Provincetown. Of course, yeah. the biggest fleet naturally was your fishing vessel in Province, the fishing fleet in Provincetown. But there was an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of uh, vessels, and uh, a lot of them were built, you know, like in Essex or uh, down Maine, Bath, Maine, and stuff like that. But a lot of them are built right here on Cape Cod too. Do you know the site where they would have been built? Was there a shipbuilding site in Orleans? Uh, I don't know where it was. Probably uh, in the Rock is, Harbor area, would it seem um, to make sense? Anywhere, obviously, you know, near the water. Yeah. Um, but uh, the actual location, uh, this would have been in the 1700s when a lot of this work was mm -hmm. done. And of course, HK, when we were kids, uh, going to school each fall, HK had the clothing store in town. And uh, you went to his store to get new sneakers and new shoes and things like that. And the mother, my mother used to, up there, she'd spend anywhere from you know twenty-five to thirty dollars on us five boys, getting us with clothes for the, you know something you'd have to spend two or three thousand dollars now if you're going to outfit your kid like she mm -hmm. used to outfit us. Mm. But it was twenty-five or thirty dollars in those days, and that was a whole week's pay for my father. But uh, you know, of bread was only you know like eight cents then in those days. What yeah. is it, a dollar now? <laughs> He was born in 1865, as I'm sure you know, yeah. and it seems like his, all his photography was took place when he was in his 20s. Right. Um, I don't see any photos really after the early 1900s. That's the last of them, 1900s. He continued with his glass plate negatives, and uh, back up into the 30s, he had a table as big as this one or bigger in the store, and it was piled high with, with pictures, prints. And he used to pay a nickel a piece to have those prints made. They're contact prints of these five by eight negatives. And he'd throw them on the table and sell them for 50 cents a piece. Because he was making them, you know, at first they were a quarter a piece. And then he finally ended up, but he'd just make pictures of people's houses, pictures of, uh, well, you've seen the variety up there. There's practically everything. And uh, I, the reason I, the library told me after a while, that they wanted to make sure that nobody could use those pictures in any publication or anything. And I said, come on, now. these things are, are in the public domain, have been there a long time because he had that pile of pictures on that. And you can ask anybody around town that can remember HK and they'll tell you, sure, you could go and buy all you wanted for a quarter apiece. Uh, Biff Bauka, who is cap one of the captains down at Mystic, he was uh, in HK's store and he can remember buying all the shipwreck pictures, well, most of them. And he'd ask HK if he had any more, and HK would tell him yes, but uh, they they won't be printed until next year, so you'll have to come back then, you know? Well, that's the way he sold them, so there's no way you can you can copyright any of that stuff because yeah. it's all in the public domain. Yeah. I've, I've been in museums all up and down the East Coast, and they've all got HK pictures. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, and I've seen them in all kinds of publications credited to museums and everything else, and he's got the original negative. Of that collection that's at the town library, yep. um, there's probably six or seven hundred photographs there, aren't there? Oh, uh, there's close to nine hundred. What, <clears throat> what percentage of his entire collection, does that pretty much, um, all the work that is available, is at the Snow Library, would uh, you say? Or is there quite a bit more work out there? There's quite a bit there? more work out. Uh, Nickerson, uh, was, was predated HK, and he had a studio here in Orleans. And uh, 
I have seen some of his work. Uh, Al Snow had some of his negatives and he asked me to make some prints for him early on. And uh, so I made some prints for him and I made a set for myself. I didn't tell him that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I've got some 1865 stuff. There's a picture taken up on top of the hill here looking across the cove to where the Jonathan Young windmill was. And uh, there's a picture taken from across the cove and where the um, uh, fog cutter restaurant is now looking this way and you can see what is uh, now the Chinese restaurant. It was a Cape Cod double house then. And then across, you look across the cove you can see the salt works. He's got some beautiful pictures of the Jonathan Young windmill up on top of the hill there that we used exclusively for a lot of the finish work that we did. And we used, took measurements off them and everything. Steve Spaulding did it. And uh, that's the reason that Jonathan Young windmill is so pretty today is because we had some of those real early pictures. We had the Jonathan Young windmill, the, uh, the mill itself, as it was in Hyannisport, and it was untouched. And we, had, we have pictures of everything inside. Uh, before it was torn down. And uh, those we used uh, extensively in the rebuilding. But the exterior, we had no idea of the, uh, we had a set of uh, cross arms, but we didn't have uh, any of the, uh, of the wind vanes or uh, the uh, tail dragger stuff or anything. And everything came from HK's pictures uh, for the outside work on the uh, Jonathan Young windmill up at the post office. They've got a whole bunch of enlargements that we did and uh, they've got them up on the wall. Well of course the whole town can appreciate that. I mean anybody can go in and look at them. They're wonderful. And uh, so it's uh, uh, they've been preserved and they've got a set of photographs that I made of the negatives in a safe deposit box. Now I was very went through every negative very carefully for the library and made a, as, the, as good a print as you could make. Then I f treated the prints archivally. That is, they were, uh, they had extra treatment all the way so they'll never fade. And uh, perhaps a thousand years from now they may start to fade, but between now and then they've got them. And they could make, uh, uh, I have reproduced and made new negatives of a lot of them. And, and in fact, I've made some contact negatives. I made contact positives then contact negatives from the ones that I'm the positives that I made mm -hmm. so I've got a lot of uh, stuff preserved anyway you did this comparative photography in 1954 19, was it? yeah 1954 55 somewhere around that there. matched and yeah. compared a, a lot of HK's yeah. scenes that he had done right and uh, those particular negatives are now treasures because of course everything has changed since then. Like, look at, look at the center of town. The, uh, uh, for, just for example, the uh, Shattuck House. Where the, the mobile station is. Where the mobile station is. Well, the picture I did in '54 is nowhere near what the mobile station is today. It I was, was Jimmy Delory station then. Wasn't no, it? it was it was before Jimmy Delory, even. Uh, I can't remember the man's name. It's an old fella, but he had a little tiny house there with the gas pumps out front. And uh, then it was shortly after that Jimmy Delory came in and enlarged it. And then of course it's been all changed since then. Yeah. We've got a picture that we shot in color of the family hop, the first family hop in January 1959. And uh, my God, all the people out on the floor are all fathers and daughters and mothers and sons. And now, like for instance, uh, Herb Wilcox was dancing with Judy his daughter, who was eight or nine years old at the time. Now she's a mother of three strapping young boys. Uh, she married to Clayton Renard. And uh, I was talking to her the other day, and uh, we she'd been trying to find her copy of the picture. Uh, the picture is a die transfer print that I had made uh, in Florida. Uh, when I did the picture, I, I had a big four by five transparency and made a die transfer print. And the print will never fade. But the damn transparency has already started to fade. It's been so long. It's an, it's, it was an ectochrome transfer. And we've got the, the old Southwood Inn. I've got a beautiful color shot of the Southwood Inn. And uh, so Nancy and I are kicking it around which one we want to use on the cover of Town Report for, nostal for a nostalgic shot of yeah, Orleans next yeah. year. And she said we, uh, and of course I've got a shot of, HK shot of, of Newcomb's house, which later came, became the Southwood Inn. Newcomb was um, a hardware dealer who had the hardware store with, 
where uh, Smith, uh, Boys, Smith was. Boys was. And he was an early town father, you know, selectman and uh, everything. And this was uh, right around the turn of the century. And so we've got a picture of his house as it was before it became the Southwood Inn. So then we can use that in the paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we can, uh, we can put the old Southwood Inn on the cover and then on the inside cover shoot a picture of old Newcomb's house, then shoot a picture of the bank the way it is today and to show the change in all things. Yeah. Kind of a nostalgic fit. You know, I wanted to just ask you, you touched on it earlier about the, uh, your windmill project. We were down there the other day and you're doing some maintenance work. Um, can you give me just a little brief synopsis of uh, that whole project? Was that your baby? Well, actually, uh, what happened was um, the Groves family had the windmill over in Hyannisport. And uh, we fought like hell to keep the East Mill here. And uh, we went to town meeting. They wanted $40,000. Uh, Campbell wanted $40,000 for it. And the town didn't feel as though they wanted. They, they figured, what the hell? What's he going to do with it if we don't buy it? It's going to stay right there anyway. Well, of course, you know, it didn't. It was packed up and moved to a sandwich. And um, so well, apparently we didn't fight hard enough because they wouldn't buy it. And so we lost the East Mill, which was the last one in town. And uh, so the townspeople didn't care. That was right across the street from the Barley Neck Inn? Right. Right by the, the Meeting yeah. House boatyard? Yeah. And uh, so what we did then was, uh, after this one came up on, on, uh, as a possibility, we went over and looked at it. And it looked great. Actually, it was a piece of junk, you know, because um, the, the Powder Post Beetles had done so much damage to that thing. But we didn't know it. And uh, so the town accepted it as per, per was. And uh, then we found out that it really needed to be taken apart lovingly, piece by piece, and put back together the same way. And so the town voted, I think, $10,000 to uh, tear it down. I mean, to take it down. Uh, and so they could be restored. And it was uh, taken down in 83, and it lay down in uh, the hangar there uh, for two years. So it took, it took us two years' work uh, to get the thing ready to go up. And uh, once, it was all volunteer work. And once we started to put it up then, of course, we hired three guys. Uh, we hired uh, Kenny Hibbs, uh, Peter Camo and my son, who is a carpenter, and he also works at the fire department, and Steve Spaulding, the four of them worked on it. And we spent $8,000 in salaries just getting the thing, the framework put up. And all that time the volunteers were down working too, like shingling. Uh, we have uh, the original bearing in the windmill that the sh main shaft supported, uh, rested on was a rock, a hollowed out rock. That was the bearing. And they used a lot of goose grease and everything in those days. And um, this is the way it worked. And everything was friction. Now, when the, the cap rests on top of a plate, well, they'd, they'd take a, a bar and, and jack up the cap of the bar and just spread some grease in there. And when we wanted to turn the cap, of course, why, it, it all turned on wood on wood. But it was, it was all greased. And everything was smooth and everything worked. So it would turn in the direction of the wind, is that we'd, the idea? Well, we'd, you'd turn it. Take two men to walk it, get down by the wheel and push it to turn it. Okay. Some mills used a horse to pull it around, depending on how much friction there was. I see. And how much goose grease they used. And how much goose grease, yep. But uh, the, uh, the windmill itself uh, is in one condition, and we don't want to break anything, you know. And we don't have to work it. We don't need corn. Mm -hmm. Uh, our next project down there is uh, once we get that windmill fixed and in place and correct, then we want to build a small salt works down there. Uh, because, of course, uh, I can show you maps of uh, the area where all the fulchers live, and all that fulcher property, that all used to be salt works. All uh, where the Nassau Marine is, all that area used to, all used to be salt works down there. So uh, what we want to do is to have a uh, small salt works with a small salt mill down in front, just as a, a historic display, that's all, because we've got the old windmill, we might, have an old, might as well have an old salt works. And, and uh, it'll be a conversation piece, and uh, uh, we hope to keep our young people educated in the ways of the old, and mm -hmm. so that they don't forget the way things used to be. Uh, when you consider what they wanted to put there, a six-story motel, 
why I guess we ended up with a better part of the bargain. That's right, I had forgotten with that proposal. Yeah. What period really appeals to you and, and, yeah, and I why does to, it? I used to talk to my mother a lot about the historic stuff. And uh, she would tell me about when she was a little girl, because she was born in 1901. And uh, the other day she would have been 91 years old. Uh, but she was telling me about how they lived in those days. Now, uh, she said that on the back porch, she can remember her grandfather and her grandmother, on the back porch, they had a barrel of flour and a barrel of sugar. And they had a, they had a, uh, what they call a root cellar. A root cellar was a hole in the ground, dug quite deep, lined with rocks and concrete, well, mortar. And it had a sod roof over it. And uh, it had an entrance way, uh, a hole in the ground where you opened up a, a uh, sort of a sort of like a bulkhead, and uh, you'd see you know a bulkhead beside a mound of, of ground, and that was a root cellar. Well, the temperature in the root cellar stayed at uh, something like 38 degrees year round, winter or summer, and uh, that's where they kept all their perishables there and they, they'd harvest their uh, vegetables in the fall and they were everything was put in the root cellar it's quite a large place uh, because all their food had to last them all winter everybody was self-sufficient they didn't have any supermarkets there were no stopping shops and there were no automobiles and the fish cart came around once a week the meat cart came around once a week the uh, there were no telephones uh, you could write letters back and forth this was the late 1800s, and it was quite an interesting era, the way people lived, and uh, the elegance of their households can be seen in some of H.K.'s pictures. I mean, one of his dining room shots with all the glassware and all of that uh, sandwich glass. I mean, just the, everything was just so nice, and uh, people took care of things, and uh, houses were, uh, were different. They took pride in their architecture. Oh yeah, sure. No electricity, but they had time to spend two years building a house. And yeah. because go of down, go down to the someday go down to the uh, Captain Linnell house, and go in the front door, and then turn around and look at the gra sandwich glass panels lining the front door with the fancy glass. All I mean, boy, that stuff is gorgeous. I need to do the stuff like that anymore. Everybody's in too much of a hurry to live a fast life, but in those days, everything was slow. And if you want to go to Nantucket, uh, you look at some of H.K.'s pictures. Sailboat races, well, they all had these catboats. And uh, a man was measured by his catboat. If he had an, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, I've got some of those pictures there, you can see these guys building new boats and see them just after they've painted them and the sailboat races on the cove. That was the excitement. I mean, we didn't have Batman on television in those days. We had a good sailboat race on the cove. And that was the big thing. We didn't try to cover up the fact that uh, that we're putting new lumber on because of the fact that this adds to the story about the windmill. The fact that when you restore something, when, uh, if you try to make it look like everything is old, why then it's, it's not a true restoration. So that we do have some some new pieces in here that are that were added on either a either a tenon or a modest, and uh, that way that. Uh, they can get a general idea of how much really a lot of work that went into the thing. I mean, if you could have seen this thing down in the old hangar down there in Sky Meadow where we were, we had a pile of lumber and we had more than one person come in and say, this is all kindling wood, you know, make good logs for the fireplace. But it ended up, as you see it here, and, uh, so. and we're naturally kind of proud of what we did. Oh, yeah. Because it, it, it adds to the adds to the town, and it, you know, in a lovely setting like this, right on the cove, where people can come. And in the past two summits, we've had experience with people coming over, and uh, they'll go down over there. There's benches over there. There's benches around the mill, and the people and the children will play out in the, in the hollow there, and it's really lovely. So it makes it all worthwhile. And it's something to pass on to our kids. 
Then you get your name on the brass plate in there. You know, <laughs> big deal. <laughs>